Welcome to the Competitive 40k podcast brought to you by Vanguard Tactics. This is a Warhammer 40k podcast where we analyse the meta and help develop strategies to help you become a competitive 40k player. I'm your host, Stephen Box, and it's our mission to raise the standards of the game both on and off the tabletop. This podcast is brought to you by the Vanguard Tactics Academy the only online coaching course for Warhammer 40k. And the Vanguard Tactics Academy takes you through everything you need to know about 40k from how to write the optimal army list for your faction to advanced tactics on the tabletop and advanced game theory. We'll also teach you our step-by-step process to prepare you for any tournament. And the VT Academy will not only help you win more games in the right spirit of the game, but also help you get more value and enjoyment from your hobby but will also help you feel more confident and comfortable every single time you step up to the table. Now, welcome back, guys. This is episode four, and we have an absolute cracking episode lined up for you today. I'm joined with Jack Downing and also Joe Coles, and we're going to be talking about all things secondaries. So make yourself a coffee, a brew, a tea, a beer, whatever it is you want. Sit down, enjoy, take some notes, and also if you want to grab our show notes and also our cheat sheet that we have made available all about secondaries to help you pick the right one for your faction then all you need to do is head over to www.vanguardtactics.com forward slash blog forward slash s2 ep4 and you can grab your cheat sheet all about secondaries now really hope you enjoy this one it's an absolute cracking show so let's get on with that show right now But before we dive into the show, I want to give somebody a huge shout out, and that is Bill Gates' 4,200 official account. And he said that not only are Stephen and his guests incredibly knowledgeable down to the minutia of Warhammer 40,000, but sportsmanship and giving your opponent a fair chance are absolutely stressed, which gives us this game an absolutely fair challenge it truly deserves. And he said this is a five-star competitive done the right way. So again, thank you so much, Bill Gates official. And uh, if you would like to leave us a review on the podcast, then please head over to Spotify or iTunes, wherever it is that you listen to us, and please leave us a review. It is most appreciated. So as I mentioned today, we are joined by Jack Downing. How are you doing, Jack? I'm very well, Stephen. How are you? Yes, mate. Doing very, very well. And Jack, we've got an absolutely epic show lined up today, haven't we? We've um, obviously already done this show once before but the audio we had some issues with it so we decided to you know do it redo it for you listeners because audio is so important on a podcast and we want to make sure we do this podcast right so apologies this is coming out a couple of days later than expected we should hopefully go back to our normal regime of every friday from here onwards so um jack what was some of your thoughts on you know our first sort of run of this uh this podcast I think it was a, a show crammed full of interesting insights into all things secondaries. Yeah, I would agree with that. And Joe, how are you doing today? I'm very good, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Finally, my first podcast of Night Edition. Yeah, it's well, we had, to, we had to get you on, mate. You know, share some some value, some yeah. knowledge. Just drop those knowledge bombs. Yeah, and as I said, I've been working here. I've had a lot of hands-on experience with, with Night Edition. We've played a lot of games, a lot yeah. of playtesting. So... I should have a bit of a grasp on this. Yeah, you've obviously got a tournament under your belt, and yeah. you're, you and Jack are commentating the next Vanguard Tactics series event, which is coming up on the 3rd and 4th of October. Anyway, so um, we're going to be talking all things about secondaries, and we're going to be talking about what the secondaries are, how many you score, when you pick them, how you pick them, um, you know, how many points you should be aiming for per secondary is a good winning score, how to deny your opponent points, the, the main secondaries, the mission ones, which ones are stackable, which ones you should go to, which ones you should avoid. So we've got so much for you. And then we're going to give you in another episode decision making secondaries based on, you know, for example, the mission or your or your opponent's list or even your list and then some advanced tactics in terms of the list building stage. So that's going to be in the part two of the show. So in part one, we're covering the core basics, and then we're going to move on to some advanced tactics in the next episode. So, Jack, what are secondary objective missions? So secondary objective missions are one third of the way that you can score uh, victory points in any game of Warhammer 40k. Um, The other two, um, so you get 10 points for a fully painted army, 
and then you get 45 points for the primary mission, and then there's 45 points available for the secondary missions. Nice. And they are a cap, aren't they? So you you have to pick three secondaries, and they are capped up to 15 per secondary. So you can't score you know, 20 on one, 10 on another, and then 15 on another one. They can only be scored up to 15. Is that correct? Spot on. Nice. And at what stage, Jack, do you actually pick the secondary objectives? So the secondaries uh, are picked um, after you, you arrive at the table, you meet your opponent, you discover what mission you're playing. And at that point, you both um, concurrently write down the secondary objectives that you're picking uh, and then reveal them both at the same time. And this is all done prior to deployment. Yeah, and I think it's one of those things that it's really important to note. And I don't know, Joe, if you've ever felt this, but have you ever kind of felt your opponent try to lead you on what secondary you should pick? Yes, yeah, so sometimes you'll be at a table and say if they've got the, the app, in front of them, or they've got a whiteboard or a bit of paper, um, they'll, they'll, it'll come across that they're just being courteous and nice, and they're like, okay, what are your secondaries? I'll write those down, and then I'll write my ones down. Yeah. But obviously, by you telling them yours first, they can adjust or change based on what, what, you they, what, or what you've picked. Now, sometimes it can be intentionally that somebody could try and do that to you, but there's also the ability that or there's also chance that you could inadvertently persuade them, even if it was a completely innocent, them just asking you what you want to you know, write down. Um, and then that still can influence them in a sort of subconscious way. So somebody might be doing it in a way that isn't intentionally sort of bending the rules or cheating, but it can still influence their decisions. So this is something that, you know, I know that I've done myself in the past. Like I've said, oh, what secondary is you going to take? And I haven't actually put mine in first. I'm still mm. considering them. Um, or if they start, sh you know, telling me I'm going to take this, 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 and this, and I haven't had time to think about what I'm going to do yet. So I now go into that game saying, okay, have a think about your secondaries. I'm going to write down mine. Once you're happy, and once I'm happy, we'll then swap. So I have that, you know, brief at the start, which basically outlines here's how this is going to go down. They get their fair opportunity to pick three, and I get mine, and I don't have to. The worst thing is, is when you're trying to think and somebody else is talking at you. Yeah. I mean, I'm just not good at listening in, trying to think at the same time. So um, I definitely need that um, that pause because it is really big. Like if your opponent picks something, which we're going to come on to later, um, and you've gone for the complete opposite, you can completely deny them a, such a huge amount of points when you know that information. So it's incredibly important you do reveal simultaneously. Um, now, obviously, we've gone over that bit. Now, Jack. Is there any um, sort of things that we need to consider in terms of, you know, there's obviously the, the mission ones, and then there are, in terms of the main secondaries, there's Battlefield Supremacy, No Mercy, No Respite, Purge the Enemy, Shadow Operatives, and the Warpcraft classifications, and there's about three or four different secondaries per classification. Is there anything else we need to consider when we're picking the secondaries? Like, can we go for all Battlefield Supremacy secondary missions? Uh, absolutely not, and I'm sure lots of us wish we could, but uh, you are capped at one secondary from each category. So you could take one from Battlefield Supremacy, one for No Mercy Respite, and so on and so on. Okay. Um, yeah. Nice. Yeah, and the mission one doesn't count as a category, does it? Because each of the nine different chapter-approved missions come with their own, sec uh, their own secondary that you can pick. Um, and also sometimes you need to be aware that the mission actually has a special primary role in regards to how objectives are held and that then might also influence your ability to pick certain secondaries because it could stack with you know some of the secondary missions so it's really important to also consider those special missions on the primary now um jack when you're picking a secondary obviously we know it's capped at 15 each what are you kind of aiming for as what you think I mean, obviously, in an ideal world, we'd love to get 45, wouldn't we? But what do you think is a good score that could put you in a winning position on those secondary missions? Uh, I think from all the games that I've had, um, to get yourself in a winning position, you look in between 10 and 12, I would suggest, as a minimum for each of these objectives. So you just need to consider that when you're, when you're picking them. Um, 
you may look to take one because oh, I could score 15 on this, but the probability of that might be very low. So you might actually go, I'll take a safer 10 points instead. So it's all those kind of things you need to have a bit of a think about. But I think on average, you're looking at 10 to 12 per category. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Would you, Joe? Oh, 100%. Yeah, I think that's nice. Because if you get, you know, three lots of 12, that's 36. And you score a good, you know, 35 to 40 on the primary, plus your battle painted points. You're in a pretty strong, like, 80 point camp. You know, that's a winning position, I think. Um, And it gives you plenty of room then to start denying points. And we're going to you know, touch on in probably the advanced tactics stage, what denying secondaries is all about. No, I love that. So let's go through the main secondaries. Um, Now, Jack, you're going to talk from the perspective of, you know, possibly a Tau player, aren't you? Is obviously that's your main army. Um, Yes. So you're going to look from the gun line perspective, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Or the mobile gun line. Uh, Joe, what sort of perspective do you Um, want to take on this? So I'm obviously predominantly a Drakari player, so I'll kind of go from that like fast-moving but weak army kind of perspective. The glass cannon. The glass cannon. Same for like, I've been practicing a bit with Gene Tiller Colt, and they kind of function in a very similar yeah. kind of way. So okay. I can come from the, the glass cannon. And then I'll cover the, um, I don't know, the Blood Angel Marine. Yeah, just Marines in general, because I think as a faction, they're like an entire different beast to everyone else, aren't yeah. they? So I'll take the kind of elite army, so yeah. custodes, so those, those sorts of... So when we're speaking in these um, pros and cons, then you kind of know what perspective you're looking at, and you can sort of hopefully pick it, an archetype based on one of the ones that we've mentioned here um, to sort of give you some sort of clarity and context to this, because obviously we can't cover every single faction. No. Um, but... Okay, so let's have a look at Battlefield Supremacy. The first one is called Engage in All Fronts. Well, fronts even, not fronts. Uh, fronts, And you get two to three points per turn. It's scored at the end of the turn. And in order to score this one, you need to have a unit wholly inside a table quarter. Um, and if you have basically three of the table quarters covered, you're going to get two points for the turn. And if you've got all the table point, all the table quarters covered, you're going to get three points. The only um, premise to this one is that you have to be outside of six inches from the centre. So, Jack, what's your thoughts on engaging all fronts for an army like yours? So, I think engaging all fronts is probably one of the most commonly taken secondaries. Certainly, in my experience and the armies that I've played to date is that most armies have access to cheap, um, we'll call them throwaway units, that can just run into different table quarters and and score these points. What I really like about this one is it's completely within your control. Your opponent can't deny, uh, or they're they're very difficult to to, to deny you points on this one because it's scored at the end of your turn. Yeah, and it is one of those things that, you know, you've got flying cheap units, you can just move out. And actually you can build around this one, can't you? Yeah, so I've put in my towel list, for example, lots of little drone, two-man drone units that can fly about and I can just advance them into a table quarter. I don't care if they die next turn because I've got another two-man unit could do it the next turn after and so on and so on. So I think it's an important thing to um, to to have enough little units in there to go and score some points every turn on it. Yeah, And it certainly will influence your list. Love it. Joe, what are your thoughts from your um, perspective? I... Probably take engage on all fronts in every single game I've played. It's it's perfect for Drakari, which have units like Venoms, which move 16 inches a turn and can advance. And, and they can literally just be everywhere all the time. I have access to lots of little small troop units that can kind of just pop up and, and, and basically get in all the table quarters without you stopping me. Yeah, unless you've got a huge horde or you've got uh, units that can, can string out and stop me from slipping in, then I'm going to be taking those table quarters. Same for Gene Steeler Colt. They can literally just t- turn up anywhere. Yeah. So, And I think I would agree with those um, thoughts. Mm. I suppose the only issue with engaging all fronts is people can often get a little bit too aggressive, mm. I would say, and they start to throw away. Because let's be honest, in on a table your army is going to be deployed in two of the quarters, which means your opponent is going to be in the other two. So if you're throwing away units to try and grab both of the other table quarters, 
then you're going to lose two units a turn, or you should be anyway if you're up against a good uh, competent player, which means you're going to need eight units, even maybe ten units, Yeah. because two units you need to throw away per turn for five turns. That's ten spare units to try and grab all those three points per turn to get you the maximum of 15. So I think the problem is, is people can stretch themselves a little bit too quickly and they can lose units too fast. Um, so I think actually just aiming for three of the quarters and just getting that 10 points. And if you get an opportunity late game in turns four or five to grab the fourth quarter, go for it. Yeah. Um, just to sort of eke out anything less, but aim for a solid 10. And if you can get up to 12, you're doing quite well with the engage in all fronts. I like that. Okay, let's move on to Line Breaker. Um, this obviously is two units at the end of your turn, and you have to be wholly in your opponent's deployment zone, and this does not include flyers. But however, if you do get this, this is worth a big four points. Four points if you get this one for having two units wholly within. So Jack, what are your thoughts on Line Breaker? I think uh, I think it's not a bad secondary. The only thing I don't like about it is that your opponent can deny this one happening by screening out their deployment zone. I think a lot of it depends on what armor you're playing against and how much screening they have available and the deployment zone itself given in the in the mission. But it's easier to maximize. Yeah, you need to do it for four turns. So if you're built your army in, in an appropriate manner to then to aim to do this one you're more likely to score the 15 than, than you would, say, against an engaging all fronts. But there is a little bit of risk that comes with it. It's a higher reward, higher, higher risk. Yeah. Joe, what are your thoughts on Line Breaker? I, I, I like it, but it's very opponent army and deployment zone specific. Yeah. Your, your opponent can screen you out of this, especially on some very small... Deployment ones or the or the deployment zones, which is like a quarter of the table. Yeah, they can stop you getting in. And the fact that you need to have two two units in there is a real struggle. It only really works against elite armies that want to take the middle of the table or come to you. Yeah, so they tend to leave their backline undefended. Yeah, I'm going to put a counterpoint in there. Um, I feel like on the Dawn of War deployment, yeah. so where we're kind of using the whole width of the table that's yeah. extremely hard to zone out yeah um whereas hammer and anvil super easy to zone out table quarters super easy to zone out um the ones on the angles again quite easy yeah. to to grab those i would say because they stretch for quite a long distance um so that it can be quite good on those you can build for it certainly i know i did with my ultramarine list um i have three units of inceptors and a phobos lieutenant that can come in that's four very durable units one's obviously getting the benefit of the lookout serve role um now the problem is if you only put two units in your and obviously that can all deep strike for free by the way so t turn two i'm deep striking those four units in if I was to only do it with two units, all my opponent has to do is look back, shoot one unit, and then I can't score that anymore. So they've got the chance of zoning me out, but also destroying one of the units, and now I can't even physically do it. Um, so having the four units there really means that somebody's got to apply a lot of for a lot of pressure, and they've got to really sort of backtrack in order to do it. The only good thing about going for line breaker is that it forces your opponent to hold fire. Um, and keeps them honest in their deployment zone so they can't, you know, maximize rerolls or auras because their army's stretched out across the field. Um, you know, if they are trying to zone you out, that is. And, you know, they're not maybe progressing into the midfield as quickly because they're worried about you getting into their backfield. So it does force your opponent to play in a certain way. But if you are taking it, you have to know you're going to be then be able to dominate the primary without question. And you can deny your opponent more points on the primary than they can deny you by denying you in, you know, line breaker. But I think there's some things to consider. So we'll move on. Domination. Now, this is one which you get three points if you hold more than you, uh, sorry, you hold more of the objectives on the table so let's say there's five objectives you have to control three if there's six objectives you have to control four jack what are your thoughts i think this one is predominantly the mission based it's going to dictate if you can take this one i think missions where there's six objectives this becomes very difficult to do yeah for a prolonged period of time throughout the game because you need to do all five turns to max it out um 
so I think lots of it's based on the mission. And if you've got the right style of units, so like maybe like elite melee units might be very good for this, or you know, a riptide jumping on an objective might kind of work. But or if you're spamming obsec, it might actually be a good pick. But I think you're looking at the missions where you have five objectives, four objectives. Otherwise, I think it becomes a bit of a tall task. Yeah, I would agree with that, Joe. Yeah, I think I think I agree with that as well. You have to have a lot of objectives secured in your army, but you also need to have the firepower built in to knock people off of objectives at the same time. And the the missions where you've got five or six objectives on the table, you you really need to think at the start of the game: Am I going to be able to get there? And is my opponent going to be able to sit on these objectives and stop me scoring it? Because they can easily just deny you those points. Yeah, I mean, it's very strong if you go first, um, especially on mission three, which is only five, which is called the scouring, which is um, basically um, five objectives, I believe, uh, or mission six even, I think it's called the scouring. Um, and yeah, essentially... With those five objectives, it's okay, it's doable. Um, whereas if you're going for anything, so any odd number, it's doable. Any even number of objective, it's not. Um, and yeah, basically, going first, it's great. You can move out onto the middle and you can move out onto your edges, fine. But now you need an army like Death Guard, which wants to get into the middle and hold it. Tau, which is like a you know moving castle, like what you used to do in 8th edition Jack, where you move into the middle, put everything and just sit there. Uh, Blood Angels that can dominate. Wolfen that can just pack out the middle. Ultramarines again, like want to build up their castle in the centre and use quick, you know, like my inceptor units or infiltrators to go and grab me the edges. That's fine. Um, Custodes again force your opponent, you know, to the edges and you because you want to take the middle and you want to go from either way. So it's fine for those style of builds, um, but. Night, something like a knight army just a bit get a bit extra content it's going to be very difficult to get this because they don't have objectives to sc securing units um, although they can put their model over the base of the objective and also they get the ability to heroically intervene therefore meaning that if your base is large enough you can actually prevent your opponent from getting within three inches of it without going within an inch of you so that they have to actually kill you in combat to take you off it that's a and that's an issue for somebody so if you're thinking of going domination against knights knights can deny you very easily but will be hard to score it for themselves but out of those three um jack which one are you taking every time it's engaging all fronts for me every Joe, time Engage in all fronts every and time. And I probably agree. So, uh, yeah, I think we're pretty much all decided that engage in all fronts is certainly something that you should be building for, in our opinions, or have that. You want it in your locker before you go into it. Okay, so let's move on. No mercy, no respite. This is all about killing, really. Or the next two are no mercy and no respite. And Purge the Enemy, the next two categories are mainly about killing things. So, the first one is thin their ranks. So this is where you tally up all the models killed and you get 10 points for each vehicle. You add up that tally and then you divide it by 10 and then that's how many points you scored. So let's say you killed 100 models um, or 10 vehicles then or a combination of the two, then you're going to get 10 points. So essentially you've got 150 models to kill in order to max this out. Now, Jack, what are your thoughts on this one? So, I think we all share the same opinion on what this one should probably be changed to in the future, but maybe we'll discuss that one at another time. But it's obviously very reliant on who you're facing. So, if someone brings 150 models, I think it's an auto pick because they'll be wanting to play with them all across the board, so you'll have access to destroy them. Or if someone's got a combination of um, large... Uh, model numbers and tanks so take uh, imperial guard with units of 10 guardsmen inside a chimera every chimera and 10 guardsmen's worth 11 uh, worth two points and that could also be stacked with other ones which we we'll go on to later like orcs as well potentially with all their um their trucks and things like that so yeah there's a lot it's completely dependent on your opponent yeah i would agree there completely um so yeah it is literally just all about your opponent's list, isn't it? And I've never took it. Um, I did like the ITC version, which we used to play in 8th edition, which was for wounds caused. So a 
intercessor would give up two points rather than just the one because he had two wounds and i think now with the um you know going into a meta where there's going to be a lot more two marine a uh, two wound models with for marines and then also terminate is getting an extra wound chaos across the board probably getting some extra wounds um and just you know the marine and custode meta and death guard meta we're currently in i definitely think that those armies need to be punished a little bit more um, and because it's very difficult to pick against those style lists, I know that. I um, mean, having something that would, you know, be a good pick against them, I think would be a nice option for, you know, Xenos players and things that can maybe utilize that. But um, would you agree with those thoughts, Joe? Oh, 100%. Like, there's, you could, like, play against custodies, marines of any kind, it's a real grind to kind of get your way through them. Uh, and then there's no real reward for killing them, yeah. if that makes sense. So if if a five-man squad of intercessors gives you a point, then I'd quite happily go for that. Yeah, because it's harder to get through five intercessors in cover than it is to get through ten orc boys. Yeah. Yet one gives you half a point and the other one gives you a full point. Yeah. So it's not, you know, they're not really on the same parallel at the moment. And stuff with, like, the um, eradicators, toughness five, three plus save, two up in cover... Uh, three wounds each you know that if you if you knock out that one unit it's pretty much giving you a point i think it should be that rather than you know a, th a third of a point so I, I, again i think it needs to be um added in anyway grind them down so this is you basically get more points than sorry if you killed more units than your opponent in that battle round then you basically get three points so if you get the kill more in the battle round, you get more. Um, Jack, what are your thoughts on this one? So it's really interesting secondary. Obviously, it's got taken. It's uh, it's designed from ITC, but now we don't know who's going first when you're picking these secondaries. So if you if you're an army that prefers to play second, and if you win the roll off, you'll take the second turn. Then this might be a better pick for yourself. But if you feel like you need to go first, maybe you want to stay away from it. Because you need to score it every single turn to max it out. And if you're going first, your opponent gets to match your kills to deny it a turn. Uh, certain armies will give it away. Uh, potentially more like um, Orcs, G, Seal of Coal, Imperial Guard, have some squishy, squishy units. But then be careful that you don't fall into a trap. So example would be a Tau list. I've got all these little two-man drones getting me engaged in all fronts. But if someone takes grind them down against me, I'm going to stash all those drone, all those little drone units in my back corner ruin hidden. Then you've just got to kill the suits. So that could all, that could then swing, and I could look to deny those grind them down points then. Yeah, or you can throw all of your cheap units away turn one, max yeah. you engage on all fronts for two turns, and then whilst they're out in the open trying to kill you, you can then gun them down, so you can basically bait them. Um, and I think as well, the other... The other thing that you said here is, yeah, it's really good if you go second. And just to clarify why that is, guys, if you're listening, is because you know. So let's say with let's say me and Joe are playing. Um, it's, it's turn one. Joe's going first, and he kills a maximum of two units, right? I know going second. I just need to kill two units. Once I've killed two, I can stop. I don't need to keep killing because I know I denied Joe that secondary or. If he's killed one, then I just need to kill two and I can stop and I'd get the kill more if I went for it. So going second, you're in the power position. Now, if, if Joe's took, grind them down, and I win the roll off to see who goes first and second, I can elect to go second. So I can now make it incredibly difficult for Joe to score his grind them down. Because even if he um, wants to go second, I can stop him from doing that. So that it, you've got a 50-50 chance either way. Um, and I don't like I don't like a game where you're rocking up to the table with a 50-50 chance. Um, so let's move on. While we stand, we fight. Um, this is five points for each. And this is scored at the end of the game. You get five points for having the three highest pointed models in your army alive at the end of the game. Joe, I'm going to start with you. What are your thoughts on while we stand, we fight? Personally. Um... I'm not a great fan of this one. You're because not a great everyone, fan? Uh, I, I say everyone I've played against, both you and Jack always take it against me. And you put it on, on units that I don't want to have to deal with. Because you, 
So in your army, you put it on Kalga, you put it on your Bannerman, you put it on Tigerius. Um, and I don't want to be dealing with those because I want to be dealing with your aggressors and your interceptors and stuff. So I want to leave them till last. Uh, the problem with that is that it means that I've got to wait till turn five. Or I've, I've probably got to fight my way through to them to turn five. But by the time that's come around, you've hidden them. I can't get to them. Um, against Jack's Tau, he just puts it on three Riptides. Yeah. And my armies that I kind of run don't deal or can't kill those things. I tend to ignore them or just try and pin them into an area, keep them stuck there whilst my army scores other points. Uh, so it puts you on the back foot from the beginning because you essentially know that you're starting the game 15 points down. Yeah, you've got to go and grab them. Yeah. I remember when, the, when we first went through the secondaries, you actually looked at this and you thought it was an awful one. Yeah. Because you looked at it straight away through the lens of your Drakari. Yes. And that was your three Ravages at the time, which you yeah. know die. Whereas for me and Jack, we looked at it, and I always play infantry army, so my top units were always characters. Jack looked at it from a you know from the most durable unit, or one of the most durable units in the game, which is a Riptide, and thought, great, this is yeah. fantastic for us. So um, I think while we stand, we fight, is a fantastic I... secondary I've actually, since the first recording, taken a little bit of a 180 on my Ooh. stance, especially for Tau. Okay. Because with the Tau, I'm struggling to get the primaries because I need to get up the board. And what I was finding is I was scoring my while we stand me five points, but I'm having to play so conservative with those Riptides because I can't afford to push and be aggressive with them in the case that they do they get caught out in combat or get shot off the board. So I'm starting to build a far sight enclaves list, which only has two riptides, and I'm moving, trying to move away from while we stand, we fight as an auto include, so I can play a bit more aggressive, get them on the objectives, and force my opponent to get them off. Okay. It's still a very good secondary. I think your example in your ultramarines is the perfect scenario for it, because you've got all these nice buffing characters that are surrounded by highly, highly durable elite infantry that they're very unlikely to be killed. Yeah. And so you're talking now from a perspective of when you were a static gun line, it was a good pick, but you've actually found you were, you know, lacking the ability to push on the primary. So it's more of a mobile gun base where you you know, you need to be a lot more flexible with the units you lose. It's not such a great pick, right? Um, I've had some really good success recently using wave serpents as my while we stand, we fight because they're hard to kill. People don't want to kill a Wave Serpent because they are hard to kill. I can put all three in reserve until turn three for three CPs. Um, they can just come down and hide for two turns of the game and I get those 15 points. So Wave Serpents are really good while we stand, we fight. I found because I can just keep them in reserve for three turns of the game. And again, if I'm going second, then that means my opponent's only got turns four and five to actually kill them. And they're probably not going to because at that point they've got other situations on their hand. They need to deal with like Shining Spears or... Wraith Blades or something that's punching their face in. So, yeah, again, very much dependent on your list. Um, but don't, you know, you can think about these things, all about survivability. Um, I mean, this is probably my favourite one, so I could talk about it all day, but in one I always sort of aim for. But um, what, out of those three, any there yet? Or do you just kind of, Jackie, thinking I'm going to stay away from this one completely, there's no mercy, no respite options? No, I, I, st I, st I still certainly have while we stand, we fight as is in Malocca. It's still, you know, Riptide's still very durable at the end of the day. But as it was a auto-select for me. Now I think it's more of a secondary one for, for myself. And I, if, if if the battle looks like or my opponent looks like, I can definitely keep these alive whilst I'll undertaking my game plan. I'll still stick with it. Yeah, okay, nice. Um, okay, cool. Um, and I'm sure you sort of agree with that, uh, yeah. Joe. yeah. I tend I tend to stay away from these ones mainly because they're ones that my opponent still has a bit of control yeah. over on how I score them. Yeah, so, that's fair enough. Yeah. Okay, so purge the enemy. Now we're into Titan Hunter. You basically get one victory point if you kill. Um, sorry, you get ten victory points if you kill one. You get twelve victory points if you kill two, and you get fifteen victory points if you kill three. And these are basically uh, units with the Titanic keyword. Um, so against knights, this is pretty much an auto include because you're bound to kill two at least. Um, if they're if they've got one, 
you might consider it if they're if they're lacking other you know good options if it's like an ad mech list or something and you're really struggling for what you should pick and they've got that one knight or that one bane blade in a guard army i think it's pretty good um you know just to get those 10 points because you're probably gonna have to kill it aren't you, you can't really leave a titanic monster running around the table because he's just going to cause havoc for you so um i don't think we need to cut you know spend too much time on this one but jack would you agree there or you got any sort of differing opinions no exactly yeah, i think that's exactly right uh, like if magnus and mortarian are there for example getting 10 points for just clearing them off you know that's a still a good secondary point do they for get something... the titanic keyword well, i believe I th- they do i think they do but just yeah, talk for an example. Even if they have one, you still bag the ten points of something that you want to kill anyway. So you're not going out your way to score those points, basically. Yeah. No, I, I um I agree with that because, like we said earlier, if you can aim for ten and it's an easy one, then um then yeah, it's fantastic. So we just checked. Um, Magnus and Multi don't have the Titanic, but they are a Lord of War, which I think is where that um confusion has ah, okay. come from. So it does explicitly say. I should have said that earlier. It is Titanic models, not Lord of War options. Mm. Normally, a Lord of War does have it, but obviously, um, yeah, not in that rare. But you are right, Jack. Like, premise is there. Get 10 points. Easy grab. Done. Because you need to deal with whatever it might be. Um, Okay, next up, Bring It Down. So, Bring It Down is... This is where you would get points for killing Morty in, in those guys. But basically, it's two points for every monster or vehicle killed. That's has 10 or less wounds and you get three points for every vehicle or monster over 11 joe what are your thoughts on bring it down i it's a very easy one to score uh depending on 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 who you're you're playing on your, your opponent can have a lot of control over this so my armies for instance give up a lot of it because i've got a lot of very small Vehicles like Venoms, six wounds, four up save. Uh, my you got nine Talos. Got nine Talos. They give them up really nicely because it's each Talos, not unit. No, e- yeah. So each Talos gives up two points. So my my what when we get to the table, I tend to just write bring it down in my opponent's box before they've even said it, uh, and then armies like Guard give it up really strongly. I know. Elder, although their vehicles are incredibly resilient, they're all over 12 wounds. So yeah. each one of those has given up three points a vehicle. Uh, I I do take this one often, but late game, if you haven't knocked out all those vehicles, your opponent can just go and sling them right flat around behind a building, and then you can really struggle if you haven't got any indirect fire. Yeah. Jack, what do you think on this one? Yeah, I think it's one of those. If you take Joe's Talos list, for example, and the Venoms, it's almost an auto take because he gives way over the 15 potential points. So he'll struggle to deny you at all, I think. But then my Tal build gives up 15 exactly. So if my opponent takes it, I could then look to deny it by, you know, and they've got to table me basically to max it out, but I can really look to manipulate the score they're going to get from it. I think at the moment, unfortunately, it just certain factions really suffer with this one. Um, it links back to the Marine point and, the, and thin their ranks that we made earlier. It's just a little bit of a shame that Gene Sealer Cult Orcs, um, Talos and Dark Elder and things really suffer at the moment. But you can definitely build a list around baiting your opponent into taking it and looking to um, deny points. Yeah, I mean, I had that with my sister's list that I built. I just I put four mortifiers in. And because I had a rhino, people are thinking, okay, well, that's an easy 10 points there. But I took the bait. Yeah, I can just stick those four mortifiers um, behind a ruin, and I am not don't really need to use them. Um, you had a lot of indirect jack, didn't you? But without any indirect fire in a list, you're not going to kill those four mortifiers from you know hiding in a cover, uh, using the obscuring benefits of terrain now. So yeah, I'm just going to deny you eight points outright. And then when it gets to late game, when I know you can't kill that unit, I'll bring them out because I'm not going to lose them at this point. Um, And then I can use them to, you know, play a little bit. Or um, an army that has a lot of indirect shooting tanks like night spinners, like, you know, or um, guard uh, basilisks in withens. Don't, you know, maybe not, don't take it because you're not going to be able to kill them because they're going to be hidden. So just remember that it, you 
we don't just play math hammer. This isn't just a case of we play on completely open tables. You're in range, you're in line of sight. So think the game is going to, it's got five turns, it's got terrain, it's got angles, it's got firing lanes, it's got ranges, your opponent can kill you or remove those units that, you know, there's so much that can happen that I don't think, you just think, you need to think carefully. Is my opponent trying to bait me here? Or is it actually one I can reliably score? But like you said, Jack, if you've got orcs are in a super bad place at the moment because they can't take their big old units of 20 because they just get obliterated by the blast keyword. And if they start putting 10 boys in a truck and they start running six trucks on the table, then you're just hemorrhaging CPs, uh, or not CPs, you're hemorrhaging victory points galore. So um, yeah, super tough for those guys. Really, really feel that for them at the moment. So anyway, cut them, cut, oh sorry, cut off the head, which is like the ITC old school of assassinate, um, sorry, not assassinate, but it's the warlord, slay the warlord. You get, a, this is a real tricky one because if you kill the warlord in turn one, you get 13 points. But if you kill the warlord in turn five, you only get one point. So there's like a sliding scale depending on what turn you kill them in. Jack, I know this is probably your favourite one. You're always going for this one, Jack, aren't you? No, I, I, I like the idea. I think it's just, it needs a rework. Uh, if it needs to inverse the table or increase the points in every given turn. But if you if you went for it, you you make sure your warlord doesn't t die a minimum till turn three and he only given up six points and he could just put them in reserve to do that it's it just doesn't work does it no i don't I, th I think it's rare that you've got a targetable warlord um and even like a magnus that could be a warlord put him in reserve for two turns bring him on cast all the powers on him and your opponent's only got three to four turns to kill him and they're probably not because your army's had two turns at obliterating your opponent to the point where they can even kill him um yeah. What I don't understand about this specific one is that why is it only 13 points if you kill your opponent's warlord turn one? Why isn't it 15? I think it should be 45 points. Because, if, because of the sliding scale of five turns, surely it should just go down by three in increments every turn. And then the last turn, you should still be able to get three points by getting your opponent's warlord. Because I think I think what GW have done here is they're trying to look at it from the whole player spectrum. Mm. We're looking at it from a very niche perspective of a competitive player where we're looking at go, cool, well, I'll just put my Warlord in reserve for two turns and you're not going to be able to touch him or I'll just deny you that ability. But in some people that are just getting into the game, they might not realise that they should be hiding their Warlord behind mm. cover or they should be putting in reserve and their opponent might have one Vindicare Assassin or three Vindicare Assassins and go, cool, I'll take that. You've left him out in the open. Cool, he's dead. Turn one, 15 points for me. And all of a sudden, that opponent's not got a Warlord. They're down 15 points. So I don't know if they're trying to cater it for all levels of the game, but I feel like in this GT pack, it shouldn't be in there or it should be a rework of maybe, maybe going back to, um, you know, old school, which is, you know, three points for Slay the Warlord, three points for Linebreaker, three points for First Strike, and three points for Last Strike. That would be a 12-point maximum. Yeah. Um, it still includes it, and I think that would be a nice selection for most people that would they would attempt to do, because it means that they have to try and kill something turn one. They can't just deny their opponent the ability to kill. They have to kill something to, in the last turn of the game, and they have to go after the Warlord as well. So it means they have to actually be out and about of the table, so I think that would be a nice change if they made that in the future. That's my feelings. I don't know if you do you two agree with me on that one, Jack. I I love the sound of that secondary. Yeah, it's not maximum because it is you know it shouldn't be a fifteener, should it? But even if you got first strike, last strike, and line breaker, that's still a good nine maybe, points. Yeah. Well, well, maybe if you got all four, then you go to fifteen. Potentially, yeah, yeah. So it's three a piece unless you get all four. Yeah. Yeah, so the next one is Assassinate. Um, pretty simple, three points per character killed. Um, Jack, what are your thoughts on Assassinate? I've always liked Assassinate as a secondary in the game. I think it's good. I think it um, it gives you a nice... It's a nice option to have in the locker. Uh, my only thought with it is you need to kill five characters, which most armies don't need. So 
I'd I'd hope it'd be five points or four points for each character that you killed, um, which will make it a bit more achievable against most opponents. Because at the moment, not many people are taking five characters in the list to max it out. Um, I think it's one uh, it's one of those things though to be very careful that you could fall into the trap of your opponent um, having lots of characters and they can easily deny you scoring any of those points. So it, I think it's a good one if the points are available to get to, you know, at least 12. They've got four characters that you can think you can get. But just be aware that it could be very difficult and challenging to get there. So you've got to have the right tools to do it. Yeah, I think um, we were talking earlier, Joe, weren't we, about your yeah. Gene Stealer cult list. On paper, they've got loads of characters. They all look pretty squishy. But actually, when you've got, you know, six plus in Feel No Pains invulnerable saves you've got the ability for other units to jump or other models to jump in front and take the wounds for them um and also because they're super cheap you don't even need to use them like some of the assassins and stuff that gene stealer cult can take you can go cool i'm just going to stick them in the corner of my table and i'm not going to let you touch them um i don't know have you got any other sort of thoughts on assassinate it's a it's a really it is it, it can be a good one if your opponent has got Lots and lots of characters like guard, chin stealer cult, stuff like that, but it's easily deniable, especially if you pick assassinate and your opponent takes whilst we stand, we fight. So, say for instance, I took it versus your ultra wings, you've got four characters there, but at the same time, you're taking while we stand, we fight. You hide those characters from me, and it's quite easy to behind cover. You've bagged yourself 15 points and you've denied me. 12 points and that's a huge swing yep yeah. that's that's a that's a winning game swing right there yeah and that is why you have to reveal your secondary simultaneously yeah. because if you said to me first i'm gonna take assassinate i'm gonna go cool so i'm gonna have to try and hide my character so i'll go while we stand we fight mm. swung that game already even before we've started yeah. you've got an uphill struggle i'm sat there just hiding i don't even need to score yeah. anything but like we say, like like we teach on the academy, it's, it's that's the importance of looking at your opponent's list and thinking about what secondaries they're going to take. Like on the face of it, you, you immediately probably wouldn't think that the ultramarine player would take while well, we stand, we fight. But it's one of those ones you have to consider. But it can be a great pick against really combat heavy uh, characters like Harlequins, yeah. which have got lots of troop masters, solitaires, characters that are easy to kill in your face and your opponent has put them in his list or her list to you know run in your face and kill you so by taking it you are saying look you can hold back all your nasty combat characters if you want but that means i'm going to excel in other stages of the game because you can't use your characters and if you do use your character you're giving me three points so that's the other the other element to it but like joe said there this is what we teach on the academy. You have to ask the right questions at the start of the game. And we help people with cheat sheets and all that good stuff um, to make sure that they, you are asking the right questions. And if you want to see our breakdown, we've actually made a cheat sheet of all these secondaries. We're going to put that over on our Vanguard Tactics blog page, which is www.vanguardtactics.com forward slash blog forward slash S2 EP4. Head to that and you'll see our cheat sheet that you can download for free. And we've basically, you know, wrote these out in a very quick format. You can see if it's end game scoring, if it's in your opponent's control or if it's in your control. Um, and, you, you know, you're going to be able to see which ones are stackable. All the combos are there for this cheat sheet. So go and definitely check that out. So that's Purge the Enemy. We've got two more to cover and then we're going to move on to in episode two, which will be out. On Friday of this week, um, we're going to then cover the um, advanced tactics in terms of list building, denying, and some of the stackable combos. So let's have a look at shadow operatives. First one is raise the banners. This is an infantry unit, and basically what you do here is an action that you have to uh, do. We haven't actually spoke about actions yet, which we'll talk about in part two um, into the specifics of doing an action. But you do this action with an infantry model on an objective and you basically raise the banner in your turn and then from turn two onwards at the start of your command phase you basically get points based on how many banners you raised. You can do multiple, you can raise multiple banners in a turn and yeah you, they are accumulative and then depending on how many banners are still raised at the end of the game then you also get some end game points as well. Jack what are your thoughts on raise the banners? 
so I think it can be a great secondary in certain missions when you have at least two objectives when you're near or in your deployment zone because you could pop those banners up on turn one keep and defend those positions all game and then you've got a guaranteed 10 points then you could look to then push into a third objective to maybe get to 12 to 13 14 15 points so I think though in those in those style of missions it's a really good pick yeah, no, I agree. And I think you've um, you've really got to look at the layout of the table and also the terrain. Um, and the I think like missions three, five, six and eight, they're just not really doable because the, you know, unless you've got lots of infiltrating units that can start, you know, in the middle of the game, in the middle of the table, um, you're just going to really struggle to get them up. Because ideally, like you said, Jack, there you want at least two to three in your deployment zones, so you can get them up. And then turns and then make sure you continue to hold them for turns two, three, four, and five. So that's four rounds of scoring, which is going to get you that 12. And then holding another three at the end game is going to get you that 15. So, um, yeah, you're right. You've got to have those ideally three very close to your deployment zone, and not all of them have got that. Or if they're out in the open, or if you're against a heavy objective based list, um, what are your thoughts, Joe, on Raise the Banners? It's. It, 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 like you say, it's like a, a double-edged sword. You can you want to you want to be able to have two objectives easily accessible to you with a nice bit of cover, and if you can do that for your five turns end game scoring, you've got a comfortable ten. But if the objectives are in the open, uh, it it can become a problem because you're then sacrificing units that will potentially be shot off, and then if your opponent comes over, they can easily take it off you. But I suppose you can also use it as a law. I was thinking about a game that I had against Ben Jones where, where there was four objectives, but two of them were in the centre in no man's land and neither of us wanted to take them. But if I'd gone and taken taken them, he'd shot me off, but then had units in in waiting. So if he did come and take that objective off me, I could jump on him and, and kill him and then that could have been a way of drawing his army out because he knows that he has to come and take him off me. Yeah, it is quite easy to deny as well, because yeah. what you can do is you can only raise the banner at the start of the turn in which there are no enemy models within scoring range of it. Yeah. Uh, so it's at the end of the movement phase you do this action, so you can move on to it, but if there's an enemy unit within three, you can't raise it. So I was coaching somebody yesterday with their Necrons, and we're using Tomb Blades, um, we went first as a Necron player against Death Guard. He went for Raise the Banners, which is a really good pick for him on this mission because there were five objectives and he wants to you know, get into the centre of the table, put up the banners. So what we did was we moved you know, cheap units of Tomb Blades onto each objective. So therefore he couldn't... And we put them over the centre of the um, objective marker itself. So he had to either move and stay over three inches away from the objective or he had to so if you wanted to take me off it you had to charge them or charge these tomb blades and he can't raise the banners because there's models there no. so i could we were just denying him the ability to raise any banners because we were just literally chucking units on objectives so not only were these tomb blades scoring us engage in all fronts but we were also denying him raise the banners. So again, what we talk on the talk about on the academy in a lot of detail is this sort of saturation of threats. And in this case, we had a redundancy and a kind of a unit there fulfilling two roles for us, uh, which was absolutely brilliant. So, um, but I'm certainly building for raise the banners in my lists. Um, Jack, are you are you building for this one, or are you kind of leaving this one alone? Uh, I, I think. Uh... In particular, the tower perspective, they really suffer with decent, durable infantry to do actions. So generally, I'm I'm staring, staying clear of all the action-based secondaries, which are relying on infantry to do. Yeah. No. Okay. No, I'd agree with that. So, Joe, what are your thoughts on the Drakari, on Drakari's perspective, or an army like that from from a glass cannon perspective of raised the banners? Um, I probably wouldn't take it because my army always wants to be moving, and my objective holding units are only small five-man squads which are easily cleared off so if i was going to be holding banners i'd want to have one or two in my deployment zone which is only available on one 
or two of the deployment map styles. Well, once you've got them up, they stay up until your opponent yeah. takes you off them. But, but obviously having obsec units on there, which are good durable troops, yeah. then you can deny your opponent and, from doing it. And they don't have to be on there for the whole turn. If they're in there for one phase, then they take the object, they take the banner down. So, for instance, an orc unit can move onto it and then charge away from it. But because they're in it during their movement phase, the banner is taken down. Yeah, yeah. So, Okay, cool. So the next one is investigate sites, and you get three points if you're within. You do this action within six of the middle of the table, um, and essentially you just do it if there's no enemies within six of the middle. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the criteria. Um, Jack, what are your thoughts on this one? It's it's an interesting secondary. It can be quite easily denied. Uh, because you can't start the action if there's an enemy unit within six the center of the board. But that being said, if you're a uh, army that um, I think the Ultramarines, your Ultramarines infantry list is a very good example that can perform this, um, or potentially a Blood Angels or Space Wolves that can heroically intervene if you come within six the center of the board. Armies that want to take the center of the board, hopefully there's a primary objective there as well. I think those two marry up quite nicely. But I think you just need to be aware that if one enemy model is in six and center, you cannot start that action. And you've got to do it all five turns to get that maximum of 15. Yeah, and you can easily, like you said, deny this just by feeding a unit into the middle and um, just stopping your opponent. So if you're going first, put a unit on the middle, cool, your opponent can't do it until they've killed you in their turn, in which then you just feed another unit into the middle. Um, it's very easily denied. And, like, and also, like you said, if there's not objectives in the middle of the table then you're going into the middle of the table but you also need to be on the outskirts um joe what are your thoughts uh it it, uh, it is good but it doesn't engage with my play style where i take engage in all fronts so i could i tend to avoid it because you you can't be in this you engage in all fronts doesn't work if you're within six of the center so you you need quite a large a large force that wants to sit in the middle of the table and can spread out to double it up. That's really difficult, especially if your opponent goes first. It's just one or the other, basically. You're yeah. either going for this one or you're going for engaging all fronts, aren't yeah. you, really? It's one or the other. Um, but yeah, like you said, Jack, you know there could be some bills like Death Guard, which you want to hold the middle. You don't want to go anywhere near them in the centre of the table. So it could be a good one for them to go for. Yeah. It's a, there, there's one mission uh, where the one of this, the... The mission specific ones is holding the center of the table, so it can double up quite nicely with that one. Yeah, but that's that's a one once in a blue moon kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, if your opponent's got lots of infiltrators and they're already starting in the center of the table, very very hard. However, if you've got infiltrators and you can deny your opponent from getting anywhere near that center, because you can actually screen out that six inch bubble with your infiltrating models. So then even if your opponent does go first, they still can't get into the center mm. and then you can push up in into there. So you can build for it, but again, you're only going to be able to build for it on half the objectives which don't require you to be on the um, in the middle of the table. So um, just one for you to consider there. Are you building for a list that you're only going to use 50% of the time? Deploy Scramblers. You get 10 points at the end of the game if you achieve this action three times. And the action is... You basically stick up a scrambler in your deployment zone with an infantry non-character unit. You then move into the centre of the table, six inches away from the edge of their deployment zone. So basically six inches into no man's land either side. Put up a scrambler there and then another scrambler in your opponent's um, deployment zone. Jack, what are your thoughts on deploy scramblers for a good 10 points? It's a really solid secondary. It's um, As long as you've got the the right amount of units that um, that can give you the option to do it, such as cheap infantry that can start in deep strike, or you can spend very little power level to put them in strategic reserve. It's almost unstoppable to score this secondary. It's very difficult for your opponents to deny it. Um, so I think it's a very solid choice. And I'm, I've certainly looked at having the option to do it within my lists moving forward as a fallback option, just to get a bank at 10 points in those secondaries. Yeah, because you can bring on a unit of, let's say, I don't know, Fire Warriors, a little five-man unit from reserve, from the edge of the table, into your you know, opponent's deployment zone in turn three, and pop that scrambler up and it's done, right? 
Yeah, I can spend one CP to put two units of Fire Warriors in. I have yeah. one unit starting my deployment zone. They'll scramble turn one. I'll bring on the second unit in the midfield turn two, and they can scramble. And then in the turn three, I'm available to go into my opponent's deployment zone. So my opponent cannot stop it unless they screen out all the edges of the board. And it's cost me one CP to score 10 VP. That's nice. And that's what we want to do, guys, is swap CPs for VPs. Joe, what are your thoughts on this one? Uh, I I love this one. I tend to take it in, in all my games, uh, especially from a Gene C. Lecole and Jakari perspective, because they both have access to units that can literally deep strike anywhere, and they've all got tiny bases, so you can literally like hide them or bring them in from outflank, and there's no real way for your opponent to stop you from getting it. And like Jack said, unless they've got an army of infiltrators that can wrap the entire board, there's no way of stopping you from doing it. Yeah, and then there's units like I've used in the past with the Blood Angels where I can redeploy a unit, you know, in, yeah. in turn five. Great. But, you yeah. know, redeploy a unit of jump pack guys. They land down. They can fight all game. Um, and if they're not over there, two CPs, and then sling them across the table, yeah. which is really good. So, yeah, I really like it. And it's any infantry unit... You know, with the Blood Angels, sometimes I've done it with Death Company turn one. If I'm going second and I know that they're not going to, you know, get in, get stuck in turn one, so I can just keep them there, you know, move, um, get that Scrambler up um, in with a fast. The only thing you need, I think, is either units in reserve if your movement is six inches, because you cannot do this if you advance. So that's the only thing to consider. If you've got infantry that move anything less than seven, you're not going to be able to move into the centre of the table and then do it turn two. So you'd need to do it turn three, or you bring a unit in on from reserve. So you need a unit like, I don't know, a jump pack unit or something or a whatever to, to really do this if you want to start that unit on the table to deploy in your um, deployment zone turn one, then move again. Um, or if it's Eldar, it's fine because they move seven because you only need to clear that six inches. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like it. I think it's a good 10 points. And it's, you know, very, like Jack said, very, very hard to deny, I think. So the final one is Teleport Homer. And Teleport Homer, I mean, I can't ever see in this one actually work, if I'm honest. I, It's going to be so hard to ever score, near on impossible. It is worth four points, but you've got to do an action on your enemy's objective, which is in their deployment zone. And you've got to stay there for a turn. Jack, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I share the same thoughts. It's the points that you get to complete the action is just not enough for what you have to then sacrifice to do it, or the risk that you got to take to get even score them. So the yeah, the number of points doesn't quite tally with that at all, I don't think. So I think it's very rarely that you'll see this one in play. If it was ten points, would you take it? 10 points a turn no 10 points just, just do it once do you it get once. 10 points oh no no if, if it was 10 points for once 15 for twice or is it what okay what if it was 15 points for once would you take it no because it, it's it'd be too easy for your opponent to deny you from doing it because if you want to deep strike in your opponent can sit on that objective and you deep strike nine away if and if you manage to make that nine inch charge and clear them off that objective, you then have to sit through their entire turn of trying to kill you, and then they have to have not captured that objective off you. So at the start of your turn, there's no one within range of it, and then you start, and then you have to go through another one of their turns. So I can't see anything shy of a 10 man. Death Guard Terminator Squad, or a ten man oh, oh, Custodies I, I, Terminator Squad, do, achieving anything like that. If it was fifteen points to do it once, stealth suits surrounded by shield drones, um, I'd put them into the list just to do it because I'm struggling in other categories. Okay, so you, you'd able, build specifically. Absolutely, but because I'm struggling. Yeah, I mean, I thought I would take this conversation to an extreme to see would you even consider it at fifteen points. And I'm not even sure I would no. with I, my builds. I probably wouldn't take it. I'd rather just take scramblers 
and and lose five points. Yeah, I think I think scramblers from there is uh, just a quick, easy ten points. Lovely. Um, okay, nice. And then finally, the last category. Um, of, and this will be the last category that we talk about on the show before we move on to the part two, which will be in next week or Friday's episode. So the first one is a bore the witch. You get five victory points for killing a psyker character or three victory points for killing a psyker character, uh, sorry, psyker keyword unit. End game scoring again. Jack, what are your thoughts on a bore the witch? Oh, the only um, thing I didn't mention is that you cannot have any psychers in your list if you want to take this one so jack what are your thoughts i think if you're playing up against a gray knights or a thousand suns which have you psychic units it's it's an auto include i think the psychic character ones can be a bit of a trap much like assassinate if they've only got three psychers you need to kill all three to get those points and they'll be quite easily deniable as well yeah, no, I agree. It's the same trap is assassinate, isn't it, really? Joe, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm 100% agreement. Unless you're playing Thousand Suns, Grey Knights, or even like a, a Zench Heavy Demon list, something like that, it is, it's a trap that you can fall into and your opponent can easily deny you those points. Because uh, what they can do is, they're like, do I need these psychics on the table for the first three turns? No, I'll just put them in reserve. And then you have to try and deal with them turn four and five. Yeah, well, we do what I did in our battle report, which will uh, be going out on Vanguard Tactics Plus soon. Um, got towards, you know, I used my psychers for turns one, two, and three, where it mattered when it started to look a bit spicy for them. They all jumped in a wave serpent. Yeah, and, and then they become a real problem to deal with. Uh, so I think, I think it is a bit of a trap. And one your opponent can easily deny yeah. you. But if you're up against, like we said, one of the armies that has it, then the only thing is, are people considering dropping their single librarian, for example, in the matchup, which is, you know, the Zinch or the Thousand Suns or the Grey Knights, is it worth dropping a one Psyker in your list so you actually have this as an option against those builds? Because typically... Grey Knights are very hard to pick against. If you don't have a Bore the Witch on the table as an option, what are you picking against them? Jack, what are your thoughts? I think um, I've been playing a lot of Death Guard recently. Um, because of those powers are so good for the list, I'd still keep them. I, I still need them to make the list tick over. But if I was playing Raven Guard, the Librarians, he's on the periphery of the list anyway. I think that's his far, far nail in the coffin. He wouldn't make the cut. Because his powers aren't that influential. They aren't that great for the army. I'd rather just drop him and have this um, set of secondaries on the table for me. Yeah, so a bit like what we teach on the academy when we talk about characters. It's what characters do you need to have versus what characters do you want to have? And actually having more options on your secondary picks, that's when you start to fine-tune your list to go actually doesn't make the cut. Um, no, I, I agree with that completely, um, especially if you're lacking options elsewhere. So the next one is Mental Interrogation. You get three points if you cast this power. It casts on a four. Now, if you cast this power, you cannot cast any other powers uh, for that turn. And you have to be within 18 inches of an enemy character. And if you do cast it, you then get three points. Joe, what are your thoughts on Mental Interrogation? It can... I think the, the psycho one it only really works if you've got a spare psycho in your list that doesn't really do much or anything. So if you're running Thousand Suns, for instance, you've got your your, your key character sorcerers and they're going to be doing all your buffing powers, but then you need to have a redundant one left over that can really help you out. Or it's only going to be really achievable near the end game once you've once you know that you've you've beaten your opponent, but they've got characters knocking about that you can interrogate, and your opponent can also like like a guard player can throw their characters away and and deny you being able to score this. Well, he can run them into combat with you. Yeah. If you've only cast it once, he can run all the rest of the characters into you if you haven't gone for assassinate, and um, maybe that's what you do. Maybe you do take in that situation, a mental interrogation, and you stack that with an assassinate, so either way, they can either hide their characters, 
and that means you're going to get more mental interrogation off them or if they start to sacrifice them then you're going to score your assassinate i don't know uh jack what are your thoughts i think on paper it's one of those ones that looks quite easy to do but the, the actually the practicalities of it is actually quite difficult uh, for the reasons you just explained but you've got to get your character danger close you got your psycho danger close he's also in denial range to any psychic character as well so you got to consider that and also there are some um armies out there that can spend cps and just deny you straight away on a four plus yeah absolutely so it's so, not, um, it's not a and you need and you need the five casts to max it out you want at least four casts out of that if you're playing up against nine hands or custodies that have got these um denial on a four plus stratagems or an assassin that lowers your warp casting and you can deny you're putting yourself at a lot of risk there yeah, no. I mean, if I was a sister, you know, playing sisters, for example, and I've got that stratagem, I'm going to use that every turn on you, just to stop you from scoring it. Because again, I'm going to swap CPs for VPs. Okay, next up, psychic ritual. You score 15 if a psyker casts this action three times. It casts on a three plus, but you have to be in the centre of the table to do this, um, and you've got to cast it three times with this same psyker. Um, but you do get 15 if he does complete it. Jack, what are your thoughts? I think this is one of the better. I think this is probably the best one if you're looking for a psychic action. Uh, like Death Guard could play this quite well. If you if you balance your powers quite well, you can get this kind of sorted. Uh, I had an interesting game. I was playing my Dark Angels. I took the Warlord trait watched, so it's an auto deny once per game. I waited for my opponent to cast it twice. They went for the third cast. I blocked it and then killed the character the next turn. So you all mean of a sudden, man. I know. So all of a sudden, they thought they had a banker. I, I completely flipped on his head and denied the 15 points. So wow. again, you're putting you your mean, character, in, character in threat range because uh, you're on the center of the board. But if your Death Guard is a great example, you don't want to get anywhere near Plague Marines or any Death Guard, um, anything really. So they could just jump in the middle of the board where they want to be and they could quite easily cast that quite safely because if you're in deny range of the death guard the death guard are in, in threat grenade range, range. <laughs> but you're in threat range of them so uh yeah and it's easy for you know nurgle to take an extra little cast and you think okay i don't really need my minus one to hit power this turn cool i'll just cast that instead so um could be a demon prince or something who can only cast one power uh, anyway and he's uh, tough to kill any i think that's an important thing when you're writing your powers in your list you you may want to put the, the 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 less essential power on your prince who may only have one cast for example and have the other cast of all your important important spells so you can take the option to not cast a power to the action instead yeah no i agree completely okay nice and then we've got just to finish this off um i've never even seen this one taken pierce the veil you get eight points if this psychic action is done in the enemy deployment zone twice, and you get 15 points if you do it four times. Joe, what are your thoughts on this one? Uh, so you have to do four psychic actions over four turns, basically, to get this maxed out. In your opponent's deployment zone? In your zone. opponent's deployment zone. That's hard. But your opponent can be so I, I can only see Eldar... Windrider Farsi is doing this efficiently, but then you're feeding your opponent a character every turn and they'll just kill him off quite easily. So you might get it done tw twice at best. I think I think it should be like 15 points for maybe three goes. Your opponent has complete control over this because if they just screen you out, you're not getting in. Yeah, because yeah, they can obviously deny it, plus yeah. you're handing your characters away yeah. um, because they don't want to be anywhere near your deployment zone. Like if it was 5, 10, 15, you might consider yeah. it. Jack, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I completely agree, but there's also other things with the action. You've got to be within six of your opponent's battlefield edge and more than six inches away from enemy models. So even Tau can deny this one. Non-psychic armies can deny it. Yeah, I've just got to be within six of the psyker. So I'm outside of heroic intervention range. I'm just going to place something to stop you blocking that action. So again, the the points you score for doing this high risk action, it just doesn't match up with the points that you get. Yeah, 
Oh no, I like I said, I've never seen anyone take it. It's too, it's really you know far too situational. Unless you're really, really, really building for it, I think it's super, super tough for this one. Um, okay, nice. Well, guys, that's that's all of the secondaries. Hopefully, this has given you a good insight into which ones you might pick. Um, and then in our next episode, or which will be released on Friday, we're going to cover what we start to look at in terms of list building, what secondaries we like to pick, and we're also going to cover the mission-specific ones in this full synopsis and analysis of secondary emissions. So, Jack, thank you very much for coming on, mate. Appreciate your time as always. Uh, thanks for having me again. And Joe, smashed it today, mate. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you for letting me come on and not sit in the corner quietly whilst you record this. No, I never do that. Yeah, just... I just get I just get hidden away in a cupboard <laughs> whilst he talks 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 about missions to other people. So it's nice to be included this time. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, guys, it's um it's been a pleasure as always. This podcast is sponsored by Foreground Publishing, who are the leading designers and manufacturers of tabletop pre-painted terrain. Check out the VT Terrain series, which is perfect for competitive 40k games. Just unbox, build, and play. Now remember, if you do enjoy the Competitive 40k podcast, please, please, please leave us a review over on iTunes and give us that five-star review and maybe we'll give you a shout-out next week. So again, thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and make sure you have subscribed to the channel so you get notified every single time we release an episode. And I'll see you next week. Take care.